This is a cancer of a cell called a mast cell, which is a normal cell in your immune system. These cells circulate through the bloodstream, through the liver, the spleen, and also in the skin. They're the body's protective mechanism against certain types of infection, including allergic reactions and parasitic infections. One of the most common risk factors in developing a mast cell tumor would be the breed of dog. We often find that dogs that are brachiocephalic, such as boxers, bostons, pugs, they have a higher risk of developing mast cell tumors over their lifetime. We suspect that there's probably a genetic component to the development of mast cell tumors. Mast cell tumors are unique in the fact that they can cause either local or systemic signs. What a mast cell tumor does is it's part of the allergic reaction. So it has in it histamine and heparin and other substances. So sometimes the main issue with the mast cell tumor is the fact that it's releasing these substances into the bloodstream or into the surrounding tissues. So that the patients may be sick, not because of the tumor itself, but because of the secondary effects of what the tumor is releasing into it. For dogs that have mast cell tumors, you can sometimes see them shrink and swell. Um, sometimes we'll find that these tumors can go away for a period of time because they release histamine and then the histamine is reabsorbed so the tumor shrinks and gets smaller. We can sometimes see troubling signs with mast cell tumors because of what they release into the local tissues. Some dogs present, particularly if the mast cell tumor is rapidly growing, with a tumor that becomes very bruised and it becomes ulcerated or becomes swollen. And this is due to the release of histamine, which causes an allergic reaction around the tumor, or heparin, which causes the tumor not to be able to clot. These tumors can also be difficult to get to heal. In many cases, we will recommend starting dogs on medications that can help counteract these side effects to some degree. This would include using an antihistamine, such as diphenhydramine, which is known as Benadryl, to help counteract the histamine release, and the use of an antacid, such as amiprazole, which would be known as Prilosec, to help counteract the secondary effects that mast cell tumors can have on the gastrointestinal tract. It is considered to be the most common malignant tumor of the skin that we see in dogs. These tumors can be found on the surface of the skin or underneath the skin. And one of the things to note is that these tumors can look like just about anything. So we can't assume that something is not a mast cell tumor unless we do further diagnostics. We can also rarely see mast cell tumors in other locations in the body, such as the intestinal tract or the liver or spleen. But these are atypical to see and are special situations in which we're, we would talk to you specifically about the location and the types of treatment that are available. For the purposes of our discussion, we're going to talk mostly about mast cell tumors that are found in the skin, given how common they are and given that this is the location that we see them. Mast cell tumors can really look like anything. Um, they can be small, flat, raised masses on the skin. They can sometimes feel like fatty tumors if they're underneath the skin. Or they can be rapidly growing masses that become ulcerated or bruised. Any new lump and bump on a dog should be brought to your veterinarian's attention so that we can assess it and make sure that it's not something that we need to be concerned about, such as a mast cell tumor. The diagnosis of a mast cell tumor is usually straightforward. We would make the diagnosis by doing a cytology, and that would involve putting a needle in the mass that we can feel and then squirting the cells onto the slide, which we would then send off to a clinical pathologist. It's often very easy to make the diagnosis of a mast cell tumor within the hospital, and sometimes we don't even need a clinical pathologist to make that diagnosis. When assessing a patient that has a mast cell tumor, we would want to look at sites where mast cell tumors can spread. This would include the liver, the spleen, the regional lymph nodes, or rarely the bone marrow. 
How likely this is to happen depends upon the particular mast cell tumor. When we're doing testing, we will often do an aspirate of the regional lymph node, that is, put a needle in the lymph node and get some cells out to look for high numbers of mast cells in the lymph node. We'll often do an abdominal ultrasound so that we can look at the liver and spleen and see if there's any evidence of disease present in those locations. And usually we'll do an aspirate of at least the spleen to look for high numbers of mast cells within the spleen. We also sometimes will do routine staging tests, such as a set of chest X-rays. Although mast cell tumors are unlikely to spread to the chest, it sometimes allows us to assess the overall health of the dog. And then lastly, we will do routine screening blood work, which would include a CBC, a chemistry profile, and a urinalysis that allows us to assess a patient's ability to be able to undergo surgery and further treatment. With any type of cancer, we usually will start by looking at, is this going to be a good tumor or a bad tumor? Meaning, is it one that's likely to spread or is it one that's going to be localized? With mast cell tumors, we know of a number of different factors that can influence the outcome or the prognosis. We do know that one of the most important parts of deciding what a mast cell tumor would be is the grade. And this can only be gotten through the biopsy. The pathologist will look at the tumor and look at the features, and it helps them to decide if the tumor is going to be aggressive or not. And there are two different grading systems that we can look at. One is a system where you have low, intermediate, and high-grade tumors, where high-grade tumors are very likely to spread, or there's a system where we look at low and high-grade tumors. It basically splits the two types of tumors in half, with high-grade tumors being more likely to spread. We also know that larger tumors, usually those that are greater than three centimeters, which would be about an inch and a half, can be more aggressive. There are certain locations in the body where we worry more about mast cell tumors developing, and those locations tend to be the mucous membranes, so anywhere around the mouth, sometimes in the inguinal area, which would include anything on the prepuce or the scrotum, and then mast cell tumors that involve the digit. For whatever reason, these tumors tend to be more aggressive regardless of what their grade is. There are other features that we can look at on a biopsy that can help us to determine how a mast cell tumor is going to behave. One of the most common things that we look at is something that's called the mitotic index, which is the number of dividing cells we see when we look under the microscope. There are cutoff numbers for good and bad mast cell tumors. So if you have a mast cell tumor that is below the cutoff number, it's less likely to spread. The other thing that we can look at is the presence of a mutation that can be seen in mast cell tumors. It's called a C-kit mutation, and this is a mutation in a receptor that sits on the surface of mast cells. And with this mutation, these tumors tend to be more aggressive if you have that particular mutation. Obviously, the other thing would be is if we do see that there's evidence of metastatic disease at the time of diagnosis, those dogs are not as likely to do as well with treatment. When I look at a dog with a mast cell tumor, what I try to decide is whether or not this particular patient needs just local therapy, which would include surgery and or radiation therapy, or if it is a dog that needs systemic therapy. That would be mast cell tumors that have a high risk of spreading, mast cell tumors that have already spread to other areas in the body, or mast cell tumors that we're not able to remove completely. For local control, surgery remains the mainstay of treatment for mast cell tumors. Many mast cell tumors never see an oncologist because they often can be removed successfully in private practice by your own veterinarian there it can often be cured with surgery alone. If we were to remove a mast cell tumor and leave tumor cells behind, then we may have to consider the use of radiation therapy as a follow-up to prevent local recurrence of the tumor. Radiation therapy usually involves the treatment of 15 to 16 treatments of radiation and is typically well tolerated and is considered to be 
highly effective at preventing local recurrence of mast cell tumors that were not completely removed with surgery. There are some mast cell tumors that don't recur whether or not we completely remove them. However, there's a risk with leaving a mast cell tumor that had been incompletely removed, and if it does recur, it may be more difficult to treat in the future, or it may have a higher chance of spreading to other areas in the body. As a medical oncologist, my job is to determine which patients may need therapy beyond surgery and radiation therapy. Those patients that need additional therapy are those that we consider to be high risk. For example, any of the dogs that have negative prognostic factors that we had talked about, such as size, high-grade tumors, have tumors in bad locations, or have tumors that are more aggressively growing. Those patients, if we're able to surgically remove the tumor, may need follow-up chemotherapy in order to prevent the tumor from spreading to other areas in the body. We will also use chemotherapy for those tumors that have already spread to other areas of the body or for those tumors that, because of the size or the location, that we're not able to completely remove. And we have several options when it comes to systemic therapy of mast cell tumors. One of the main options would be the use of prednisone. Prednisone is a steroid, and it's actually a chemotherapy drug of sorts for mast cell tumors. With prednisone alone, it is a chemotherapy drug that will shrink a mast cell tumor. But the problem with prednisone is it's a single drug and a relatively weak drug, so that the effects of pre prednisone on a mast cell tumor will only last up to about a six-month period of time. We can look at using chemotherapy for mast cell tumors, and there's several drugs that are commonly used. One is an intravenous chemotherapy drug called vinblastine, and the other is an oral chemotherapy drug called CCNU. Both of these drugs are traditional chemotherapy drugs that have been used to shrink mast cell tumors or to prevent the development of metastasis in the future. The particular schedule will depend upon the reason that you're treating a dog for a mast cell tumor. For example, if we're using it as a follow-up for a dog that has a high-grade mast cell tumor, we would look at using the drug vinblastine, and it would be given once weekly for four weeks, then every other week for four more treatments, and we would include prednisone in there as well. And what we find is for our dogs that have high-risk mast cell tumors, the combination of prednisone and vinblastine can often result in long-term survival times of one to three plus years. For those dogs that have mast cell tumors that we cannot remove or have already metastasized, what we will find with chemotherapy is about 40% of them will shrink with either vinblastine and maybe about 20% with CCNU. We judge the response by measuring the size of the tumor, and if the tumor is getting smaller, then we would continue with that particular drug, potentially indefinitely. We do find that there are some mast cell tumors that don't respond to these chemotherapy drugs and will continue to grow, in which case we need to look at other options for treatment for them. One of the things to keep in mind if we do recommend chemotherapy is that it's very well tolerated by our patients and the risk of them having serious side effects from chemotherapy is only five to 10%. And most of the side effects that we see are self-limiting. So with chemotherapy, the goal is to improve and maintain your pet's quality of life, not to detract from their quality of life with treatment. If we're using chemotherapy for a mast cell tumor that cannot be removed and it initially responds, we will find that they can often become resistant to the chemotherapy in about a six-month period of time. One of the exciting new developments in veterinary medicine was the development of a targeted therapy that is specific for mast cell tumors. This is a drug that's called Palladia, or Tisarinib. This drug has been widely used in the treatment of mast cell tumors, either as a follow-up to dogs that have high-risk tumors or as a treatment for dogs that have metastatic disease or can't have the tumor removed because of the size and the location. In regards to Palladia, it's given at home on a every other day or a three times a week basis. It's not a traditional chemotherapy drug, but we still take the same precautions for clients that are giving this drug at home. You should not crush or split the tablets, and you should wear gloves when you are giving the Palladia. 
Women that are pregnant or planning on becoming pregnant or breastfeeding should not come in contact with the tablets. It's not considered to be traditional chemotherapy, although we do have to monitor for side effects that can be similar to chemotherapy, such as gastrointestinal upset, which most commonly is diarrhea. We can see a drop in the white count, and it rarely can cause changes in kidney function. So although palladia is administered at home, our patients still need to come back on a regular basis for an assessment so that we can make sure that the drug is working and that it's not causing problems for the patient that, such that we need to discontinue it. There are several other targeted therapies, including one called imatinib, that is a human drug that have been used with success in the treatment of mast cell tumors. As with chemotherapy, mast cell tumors can become resistant to these drugs over a period of time. So if we are treating a tumor that cannot be removed or is metastatic, we often will see resistance develop in about a six-month period of time. For dogs that have what we consider to be high-risk factors, such as high-grade tumors or have a mutation in the CKIT gene, those dogs, without any further treatment, often will succumb to their disease because it spreads to other areas in the body within a six-month period of time. When we use follow-up therapy using either drugs such as prednisone and venblastine or palladia, those dogs can often have survival times of one to three plus years. So the prognosis can actually be quite good for those dogs. For those dogs that have mast cell tumors that we can't remove or have already metastasized, we typically will see survival times of only about two months without any type of treatment. If we were to use drugs like palladia or venblastine or CCNU, we can often find that we can shrink these tumors for a period of time, make them more comfortable, although at some point in time, they often will become resistant to these drugs and the mast cell tumor will then continue to progress. At that point, decisions need to be made about the quality of a patient's life. When you're looking at treatment options for any type of cancer, it's very important that we consider the quality of life of the patient and that there's not a right or wrong decision. The goal of the oncologist is to help educate you as to what options are possible and what they mean for your pet, but there's never a right or a wrong decision. Our team is here to support you regardless of what decision you make for treatment. We know that treatment of cancer can always be a scary thing to go through, particularly when it's your pet that has cancer. You have to remember that when you come in to see us, you're now part of a team. That includes yourself, your veterinary oncologist, the veterinary technicians that work with oncologists, and also with the client care team. If you have any questions, we always recommend that you contact us. There's no question that's too small or too silly for us to answer. You are going through this for the first time so that it's important that you understand everything that you need to know. So we're always happy to go back over information for clients because it's a lot to take in, it's a lot to process, and we know that you're making a big decision. Your oncologist may not be in the hospital all the time, but there are people that are there to help you. If you feel that your pet is having an urgent emergency, we recommend either contacting the main number for our hospital, your family veterinarian, as they can often help in these situations, or another local emergency clinic.